Here's something that happens to a lot of students and maybe it's happened to you. You decide you want to learn to code. So you get a few tutorials and maybe you buy a course. You start going through them and it's great. But then you get to the end of the course. And what next? This is a very frequent question that I get from my students. They've got the necessary skills to do software development, but they're not sure on how to actually go about it. So let's talk about that in this video. Hi guys, I'm Jose and I've been teaching students how to code online for over seven years. Today I want to help you learn one of the most important skills when doing software development, which is how to work on software projects, either by yourself or with a team, day in, day out, and how to make them and you successful. This video is not about how to find work, but more about how to handle your software projects so that working on them is easier. Ideas for projects are a dime a dozen, like they say. What's actually difficult is to make the stuff that you're making well. I'm going to show you the industry standard process for developing software projects, both large and small, by yourself or with a team, and for yourself or for a client. No matter the size and complexity of a project, the core of this process remains unchanged. And there are five main steps to this process. The first one is that you should become a user or at least have a user in your team. The second one is that you need to populate the backlog or the actual work that you're going to do in the project. And you're going to do this with the help of the user. Number three is the bread and butter of our craft, which is actual design and coding. For number four, we've got a review. We want to show the user what we've done and we want to go through all the software that we've developed. And number five is to improve your process so that next time you can do things better. Let's talk about those five steps one at a time. Software projects have a bad rep for running over time and over budget. And I believe that happens because software projects change a lot over their lifetimes. It's not uncommon that you get to the end of a project and you decide to add more stuff. For example, imagine you're developing an e-commerce website for a client and you spend hours designing and planning and coding every feature that they ask of you initially. Then you get to the end and you show the project to the client and now comes the tricky part because they see what you can do or maybe even what can be done and they decide that, you know, maybe you should add a, a review system to this e-commerce store so that customers can leave reviews on items, right? How hard can that be when you've already done everything else? But the key thing is when you're planning and coding a software project, you make decisions based on the information you have and adding this review system after the fact could actually add weeks or even months of work to the project because you haven't planned the project for that. And so if you had decided to add this review system initially, then it may have been really easy to add it. But if you add it at the end, it can become really difficult. To prevent this, you should have the client in your team looking at the progress you're making frequently and you should build your software incrementally so that they can always be using the project and giving you feedback on what to do next. If you plan three or six months in advance, you're building up a lot of risk that some or all of that plan may not be used or useful. So how far in advance should you plan? Well, the industry standards suggest that about two or three weeks. In the industry, we call this work period a sprint. And let's take a look at what happens with this e-commerce project if you start it with the user in your team. Firstly, you may have to fight with the user slightly. Don't let them just dump on you six months worth of work and then go away and not interact with you again. You want to plan for one sprint worth of work with the user together in the same room if possible or in the same video conference given the current state of affairs. That way you can really understand how this software is going to help them because what you want to achieve in one sprint is something that will be useful to the user that they can actually take away and start using. This is called working software and every sprint should result in working software that you could give the user. That way the user can play around with the software, they can update the ideas in their head about how this software should be developed and they can potentially change their mind about what you want to do next. This really is the key to breaking down large software projects, making stuff that's useful in single sprints. That can be two, three, four weeks, but you got to make stuff that's useful in that time for the user. 
Once you've planned for your first sprint, the user can add all other work that won't be completed in that time into the product backlog. This is a ordered list of what the user thinks that you're going to tackle next. The backlog is organic and the user can add or remove work from there as they change their mind as often as they want. But what they shouldn't do is change the stuff you've already planned, the stuff that you're working on in this sprint. So I like to think of it in two ways. You've got the stuff in your sprint that you have really discussed with the user, you've formalized and you've defined well, and you've planned technically, either by yourself or with your development team. And then you've got the product backlog that is not very well defined, and really it's more uh, ideas for conversations that you want to have with the user later on when the time comes to implement that. That way, you're never spending too much time planning the stuff that you're not working on. And when you get to the end of a sprint, the user can review what you've done. Remember, it should be working software, and they can potentially change the product backlog and change the stuff that you want to work on before you plan it well. Coming to design and coding, a lot of developers think that you just design first, you get it everything ready, you make it pixel perfect, and then you give it over to the coder, and they code it, and then that's it. And, but really, that couldn't be further from the truth. If you do that, that's going to cause some problems, I would say. Designers and developers working together means that they can solve problems more easily by uh, combining knowledge from both disciplines, and also they can learn from each other. By working as a pair with your designer and being involved in both the design and the coding processes, you can do things like make compromises. For example, simplify a design so it's much easier to code. Or the opposite, you can make changes to previous code to uh, allow for new experiences to be implemented. Let me give you an example of a previous company I worked at. We wanted to add a telephone number field to a form. Uh, so the designer was working on this telephone number field and I was thinking about how we were going to implement it. You can probably already see that how could I think of how I'm going to implement this if we didn't have a design yet. But nonetheless, I was, I was giving it a think. And I was thinking, well, it's a phone number field. We're going to have to do some validation to make sure it's valid. But we can get the users to just enter the phone number in a text field. Uh, maybe an HTML uh, number field or, or phone number field. Uh, we'll run some validation, and that's about it. And so I thought it was going to be pretty easy, maybe um, a few days worth of work or something like that. Um, but in the end, what happened is in the design stage, we decided that uh, we wanted to add a drop down to the phone number field where users would be able to select the country code, uh, like plus four, four, plus three, four, etc., before entering their phone number. And this added a whole new dimension of complexity to the validation as well as to the formatting of the phone number. If I had been involved in the design process from the beginning and we had wanted this phone number to be released very quickly, we might have decided that, you know, we can just make it a text field now, release it quickly, give it to the users, and then add the drop down feature to the product backlog to be implemented later on if we decided that that was something that was worth doing. Let's say we've got to the end of the sprint, we've done two or three weeks worth of work. Now the key is that that work must be working software. You must have an increment of product that is working and the user can play with. And so at this point, you're going to do some user testing and you're going to do a review. So the user is going to get the chance to try out your product and change their mind regarding what to do next. But not only is the user the one that benefits from doing this, the team gets a massive morale boost if you have stuff to show off at this review. You can see that stuff is getting completed, features are getting done, and you can see that larger features that maybe take longer than a sprint are slowly coming into fruition. So this part is really important. If you don't do reviews and you skip too many of them, what ends up happening is nobody in the team really knows what features are working or how features are working together, how the end product looks. And so doing reviews is great. It's very important that everybody in the team uses the product frequently if possible. And reviews are a great place to start doing that. Step five is the one that everybody misses. And that is improve your process. And this is critical. You want to always have the opportunity to get together as a team without the user 
and look at what's gone well, what hasn't gone so well, what things you can change so that developing software becomes easier. And this might be you've got some issues within the team, maybe people are leaving or joining and you need to do some training. Maybe you want to introduce some new tools that are going to help you develop software more easily. Maybe you need to attend a course to learn about a new technology, stuff like that. Those are all sorts of things that appear when you actually spend time together to talk about how to improve your process. The most important thing is that everybody in this meeting needs to feel safe and to speak out their mind and they're not going to get punished. So there needs to be no blame and no fear in order for this type of meeting to be successful. But it's very important. All right, that's really everything about me regarding how to plan and work on software projects. The key point, the most important one is to break stuff down in planning for one sprint's worth of work, two or three weeks normally, so that you end up with useful working software at the end. Working software really should be the measure of progress. And if you get to the end of a sprint with no working software, that is a red flag that something is not going well at somewhere. When you're working in projects on this way, where you're always producing working software every sprint and your user is always engaged with what's going on, uh, software projects tend to never end. What ends up happening is either the user or customer runs out of budget, they, they run out of money, maybe eventually they feel satisfied and they're like, okay, I think we can stop here because the software is uh, useful. This is what we wanted. It's This seldom happens. Uh, or maybe you end up moving into something else if you're working in a larger company. Uh, but this is common with software projects for them to never end. You always add more stuff. It's not uncommon that you get to the alleged end of a software project and lo and behold, 100 new ideas are coming your way for more stuff to add to a project. If you'd like me to make a video on the tools and practices I use to work personally as a developer, both solo and in a team, let me know. I was thinking of making something like this. If we do make it, it'll be linked down in the description below and also in one of those wee cards that appear at the end of the video. But other than that, that's everything from me. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you in the next one.